Welcome to the Think Fitness Life Podcast, where we bring the mind, body, and gym together so you can improve your health, increase performance, and live your best life. For more information, visit thinkfitnesslife.com. Here are your hosts, Matt Gluckman and Eric Menchie. But, you know, without further ado, I wanted to get into this motivation concept here because motivation is very temporary, right? We might be so motivated to want to take care of our health today. And then what happens? Like my phone rings and something happens at work. The baby's crying. My wife needs me. My wife and I might be fighting. All of a sudden, all these priorities shift and I have no motivation to want to work out anymore. My motivation becomes wanting to to feel good today i want to i'm going to eat a croissant at breakfast and i'm going to you know get through this bs and just get through my day and just survive my day and then i'm going to sit on the couch and, and relax and hang out but that's not very rewarding and what's funny is motivation is actually more of a reward process so people from the outside looking in thinks motivation is this driving factor getting people to do things and actually it, it's a it's a reward system so when I, when I avoid the knee jerk reaction of wanting to blow off things and just go home and watch TV and I hold myself accountable to going and working out, it releases, uh, dopamine, norepinephrine, oxytocin, these feel good hormones that now that becomes my motivation. I, I start to yearn for that feeling and that becomes that driving force of, okay, I don't want to go sit on the couch. Not, not because I know how shitty I'll feel, but I know how good I won't feel if I don't hold myself accountable to going and working. So, you know, the big thing here is this idea that motivation drives us is so temporary. And really what drives us is, is discipline because discipline is doing what you know that needs to be done, even when you don't want to. Motivation is not that. Motivation is feeling like you want to do something because you want to do it and it's right in front of you. It's not always going to be a beautiful day like that. So, you know, you know, the, the key here is that you're not going to just find the discipline every day. Discipline is something that you choose. It's that choice that you make to, to put yourself first, to schedule your workout, to put your gym clothes in the car, to leave that conversation early or leave work on time and prioritize your health. You know, the, the other piece that, that goes into this is understanding our why, because I think so many people think that discipline is this like toxic masculine thing that you just over, you just do everything and, you know, no pain, no gain. But when you understand your why, when you understand who you are as a person, when you understand why you're taking care of your health to begin with, or why you're trying to better your position then that discipline becomes more intrinsic. You know, I mean, you know, we can probably speak onto this a little bit more, uh, just ourselves kind of like side tangent here. You know, at first for me, I got into the gym because I was tired of feeling inadequate. I was tired of feeling weak. I was tired of feeling depressed. I was tired of feeling kind of semi-suicidal on myself. But I looked at that as a gift. It's like, well, clearly I'm not happy with something. So that's what got me to, to do something physical. But then as I got into it, I realized that I wanted to help others. My why became, well, I, I have to be like a master of my craft. I have to keep doing this day in and day out. And, and that discipline just becomes more intrinsic. It's not like I'm fighting against myself. It's discipline as brushing my teeth, as washing my hair, as, as, as just general maintenance to life. I mean, what do you think, Eric? Where, where did your why begin? So, so mine began when I started playing sports. Like the why I started to change a lot of things is because I was small and I was weak and I needed to be better. From from an athlete standpoint, the other side of it is the is you know your 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 why. In, in this world is also kind of built around where you are in society and where you view yourself in society. And I think that's a big component of someone's why, because a lot of times they hear us as trainers or, or motivational people speak 
And it's like, they give yourselves a why because, you know, I wanted to be successful. I want to do that. And I totally agree with that stuff. But you have to look at the social aspect of it, of where you kind of sit in society from a young age. And everyone grows up. So everyone has to go to those teenage years where they're figuring out where they are in society. And I think that's a lot of pe where people start with, like, what's their why and what starts to drive them, especially, you know, as they develop between 16 and 25, as the brain's really developing and the prefrontal cortex is, they're really finding out, you know, executive functions of who that themselves and they are, right? At a young age, you know, kids still believe in Santa Claus at young. They really don't know a why. Their why is like, oh, let me get excited. You know, mom's home or I have a dog. Like they get excited for little things. But as we, as we get older, our why is like, okay, where do we want to be in society? And that could be like, now we start talking career path. We start talking, you know, who do you want to be? Do you want to be a good, you know, if you have kids, you have a father, do you want to be a good husband, boyfriend? Do you want to be, you know, a good business partner or, or woman? It doesn't matter what side you're on. And I think for me, that's usually where it starts. Like my why when I was younger was like, this is what I wanted to do in, in driving that past path. And on a business aspect or a career aspect, I wanted to be successful and I wanted to be very successful and knowledge about what I did. So that's what drove me. And so a big part that Eric's highlighting is, is purpose, sense of purpose and sense of role. And this is very much a, a self-discovery journey in terms of motivation and an intrinsic motivation, meaning something that's going to be more permanently there. You know, that, that really is important to discover, but it's almost like layers of an onion. Maybe at first your intrinsic motivation is just because you want to look good. And that's totally fine to begin there. And I think eventually we just learn further down the road what our purpose is. And like, I was very lucky to have grandparents and parents who are both service providers in terms of my grandfather was a, a doctor in the war and my other grandfather was a dentist in the war. And I really saw like, okay, like I didn't come from a team of, of fighters. You know, I did have some uncles who were in, you know, mortar squads and scouts and had to be the front on the front lines and stuff. But I saw that like, okay, my, it feels like my gene pool is that of supporting others. Uh, you know, if, if you think of the Hamza symbol protector and that really hit home to me. And that's where I took things in my life is, is taking a step further and being proactive and trying to make people the best version of themselves and, and unlock their biggest potential. And so, yeah, I think when it comes to motivation for, for working out, you know, it can be, it can start as taking care of your, your body, wanting to get a clearer mind, wanting to look better, wanting to be a better role model for your kids, whatever it starts at. But I think it's important to always kind of come back to this question. And, you know, another thing that I want to move on to now is you also want to try to find pleasure in what you're doing, because I think a lot of times people see someone else's plan and think that's what they need to do for success. And they just they they mirror it they copy it and that's the first place we can start but we need to kind of make it personal to us to our own fingerprint to our own goals and starting points and things like that and when you can kind of morph your program to meet your needs and be something that you enjoy but also still challenging well now you're going to keep going but if, one if it's too easy you you'll, you're probably going to blow it off and if it's too difficult you'll eventually reach a point where it's so painful and stressful to even think about that you just stop or you take a week off, you take a two weeks off. So I want to, I want to highlight that. And then another thing with motivation that I find is that people try to reap the fruits of their labors constantly, especially in the beginning. So they'll work out, work out really hard for a couple of days, step on the scale. They're not seeing any improvements and they're ready to quit. They're ready to give up. So you have to not reap the fruits of your labors immediately. You have to remember you're in this for the long run. You're in this I would, if you're just getting started, I wouldn't check in with results for at least four weeks and four weeks can be you thinking to yourself, do I feel any different at eight to 12 weeks is when you can start to, do I look any different? But I've, I've seen too many people try to reap the fruits of their labors too early and they get into despair and then they quit and they lost that motivating factor again. So I think the things I wanted to highlight with motivation again was just motivation is temporary, discipline delivers consistency, set yourself up for success, discover your why, find the balance between challenging and enjoyment, 
and then don't try to root the fruit to your labors in the very beginning. And I think with, with motivation, you can have, it can be long-term. The big word is can be. And, and people think that you, you, we wake up with motivation and you can wake up with motivation, but it's not just going to come out of thin air. It's not like someone wakes up like, oh, I'm motivated today. And I think this is where a lot of people get confused is like, they're, they're like, okay, where do I get this from? Well, it's not something you obtain. It's all the stuff, you know, we just put together into like who you are. And I think a lot of people go in that direction. You need to ask yourself, who am I? And what are the ways to be the best version of yourself? And it kind of like comes back to what I say purpose in, you know, a strong purpose is shown to increase the resilience of DNA repair antibody production, longevity, sleep improvement, all these other things by a strong purpose. So, Mm. you know, purpose is just a self-organizing life aim. So a lot of people need to just, I would say like step back and ask yourself, okay, what is your self aim? It could be this week. It could be next week, next month, three years. And everyone has different purposes for different facets of life, right? I have a purpose for working out in the gym. I have a purpose for family relationships. I have a purpose for my job. And then you kind of break that down into, okay, what do you want your purposes to be? What are your B goals? What's it going to take to get to your purpose and how you're going to be there? And I think when people start to realize that, then you start to wake up each day with motivation because you'll ask yourself, and this is what I do, okay, what am I going to be today? And what is my purpose here? So my purpose is to be a great coach. When I wake up, say, okay, my athletes deserve to be, you know, have a great coach every single day, but in the weight room, it's okay. My purpose is this. I want to look good for this person or that person. And I want to make sure that I'm driving my motivation. And that's what gets me going. Now, yes, yes, you can have motivational videos and people yell at you and scream at you. That works too. I like to turn on to hear that stuff when you need a little more, that is totally fine, but it it comes from within and then you get to this self-affirmation point where you're starting to be happy with yourself. And I know you mentioned that, like satisfied with your being and your purpose then goes, grows stronger and it becomes this cyclical thing. That's where a lot of these people, I think, view a lot of coaches or life coaches or these figures inside who have these high motivations. That's the loop that they're going in and they, they have it. And discipline, your are and right, is the end all be all of it all. Like it's not just going to, Hey, I'm going to wake up and have motivation. It's like, you have to have the discipline to do the right things to get self-affirmation and your purpose is going to grow stronger and stronger through that. And it's why it's, this is always a hard question when, when people ask like, Oh, where do I get motivation from? Because it's not a simple answer. You know, that where we've gone over there, it's just not a simple answer at all. You really have to look deep within you and I do this with, with clients and athletes and really kind of break them down a little bit to their, their, let's say almost their subconscious, right? Go to a spot. Like you asked me, what's my purpose? Now that's, that's a loaded question. I mean, we can start digging deep, like way back into, you know, 16 year old me to see what drove me to certain outcomes, certain things, right? To certain behaviors, right? right? And, and I think people need to look at themselves wherever they're at and say, okay, this is what I want and how do I direct it? So if I have someone who, you know, wants to lose weight, you know, you kind of dig into their past and kind of, you want to stir them up to get a little emotional. And so they're going to realize that this is what they're kind of hanging on to or that what maybe what's bothering them. And then you say, okay, well, this is how we're going to change it. And then that discipline comes in as, okay, as you change it, that person's going to see a different purpose as their journey for weight loss to where they see themselves. Yeah. I think it's an absolutely important piece to highlight what, what you just basically were, were showing there is how it changes, how it, how it grows. And it's, it's multifaceted to the point where you need to just start because you're not going to define what is going to drive you into motivation. I think, you know, maybe there's this illusion of, well, when I find motivation, I'll, that's when I'll be consistent. That's when I'll start because I'll just have the motivation that'll drive me. That's not the case. You, you just have to start going. And through the process, you gain insight. You, you know, uncover things. You realize what is lighting your soul on fire. And that's truly what it comes down to is, is what is uh, resonating with you. 
when it's echoing you to your core, that is like, yes, this is me. This is, you know, when you're listening to somebody or when you're reading something and you're like, yes, this is why I want to go take care of my health. Find that, find that that's your purpose. Whatever's resonating with you again, turning that soul on fire. Cause the classic line is there's no greater weapon than the human soul on fire, but it's important to get started. And that was where we saw a lot of other questions was how do I get started? Or what do I do? Where do we start? Yada, da, da. And you know, the, the first thing to understand is that, especially because the next thing I'm going to talk about is going to be a lot of things. Don't get overwhelmed. It's important not to get overwhelmed. This is like trying to learn a new language and picking up a, new, a textbook for the first time. And we're flipping through the whole textbook, just getting a brief overview. That's what I'm going to do right now with this whole getting started, because what's important to do is zoom in and zoom out. There's a book called Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow. That's the same concept. We have to get that bigger picture so we can get that macro so we can understand on the micro level where our attention needs to go. And then we're more intrinsically motivated because we know where it, it applies to the bigger picture. So in terms of health and fitness, when we're trying to make changes or get somewhere or get out of a current position, we need to get a training effect. We're trying to get our body to make changes, make adaptations, improve our health and fitness status, which is, can improve the way we think, improve the way we feel, and improve the way we move. So to understand this, you know, the basic concept I'm trying to say is the grass is greener where we water it. Just like we're talking about motivation, the more that I am making the disciplined choice of doing what I know I need to do, the more that that motivation will start to grow in us and be more intrinsic. So where attention goes, firing blows and connections grow, whether it's in the mind, in the brain, we, we talked about capillarization. We know that the more that I pump blood to a certain muscle, the more that, that my body's going to learn how to get blood to there quicker and start to create like little tributaries of veins and blood vessels to get more blood to that area. So, you know, when it comes to making change, you know, we talked about consistency. But it's small, consistent steps because this is going to have more of like a tipping effect and, and sort of the compound effect of building, having the building blocks tip and make changes in the, in the directions that we want. So when we talk about things here on this channel all the time or in all of our content, we really try to make things easy to digest and we try to break things down into separate categories. And the purpose of these categories is to, one, make things more digestible, but also make things really organized in where we need to direct our attention. Because this is like, we're, we're trying to hit a moving target and it changes every day. And where we might need to address our focus or, or, or ma make an adjustment can change day to day, week to week, just depending on our scenarios, depending on what progress we are seeing. So when we are first uh, I basically identifying things, we want to look at strengths and weaknesses because we're going to be, we got to be real with ourselves here. Who's going to be real with ourselves if we're not real with, you know, who's going to be real with us if we're not real with ourselves? What am I good at? What am I bad at? And if it helps you look at your weaknesses as areas of opportunity, this is going to be your biggest bang for your buck in terms of looking for improvements. If you have shitty sleep, well, then the, you need to focus on that. If you are terrible at moving, then you need to focus on that. If you eat like shit, if you eat fast food all the time, then you need to focus on that. We got to be real with ourselves, strengths and weaknesses. So these four categories are mindset, exercise, nutrition, and recovery. And, uh, you know, when you're building out your program or your, you know, week at a glance, it's important to kind of catch what roadblocks you're going to run into. Are you going to have problems with, with motivation and depression and, you know, vigor, like pushing yourself in the gym, pushing yourself over challenges, pushing yourself when it hurts or when you don't want to do it? Are you going to have problems with exercise? Do you know what to do? Do you know how to move? Do you know how to use your body? Do you know how to breathe properly? Do you know what movement patterns you need to work on? Do you know how to work, construct a workout program? Do you know how many sets and reps you need to do? Do you know how, how long your workout should be? You know how many days a week you should work out then that might be your biggest bottleneck when it comes to nutrition you know we the first level of, of understanding is quantity but then we talk about quality and, and timing later down the line but usually that's a big area of opportunity for people and then recovery 
And I think as trainers, the best thing we can do is help you identify what the more important ones are. And when it, when we look at the science, sleep is actually one of the most important things out there. If they could replicate all the benefits that come from sleep and put it into a pill, they would, but they just physically can't do it. There's nothing that can match the benefits of getting a good night's sleep day, night after night, day in and day out, night after night. So I think if, if, if someone had crappy mindset, crappy exercise, crappy nutrition, and crappy sleep, I'm telling them to focus on their sleep first. That's going to be the first thing that will help all this other stuff fall into place. Because we don't sleep well, we have excess brain fog, we have excess inflammation in our system, we have low substrates to produce energy, we have low substrates for hormones that allow us to perform. And yeah, so basically staying in this in this little bubble here you know we've talked a lot about motivation and discipline but i also want to just address with mindset that a lot of us have this like looming trance of of unworthiness or can't do things and this prevents us from starting it prevents us from building momentum and it prevents us from continuing so you don't want as a, who was it? it was Laird Hamilton. You don't want your own, your own worst enemy to live between your two ears. So remember that. And when it comes to exercise, I think we can all agree that movement is the basis for all exercise, proper mobility, proper control. And then we worry about capacity, endurance, and building strength with resistance training. And then with, with getting started with nutrition, I just like to tell people, start preparing your own meals. I think that, that goes a long way in terms of there's so many things that you could be doing that could be improved on. But the first thing, if you just start avoiding processed foods or, or fast foods, even like Chipotle and stuff like that, they're not bad, but just better when you can prepare all your own meals. That stuff goes a long way. But I'm going to go ahead and just let myself recover a little bit here and I'm gonna let Eric run through some of his top go-tos for where to get started in these four categories. So mindset, exercise, nutrition, and recovery. Well, a lot of them are similar, right? But the, the biggest thing as I like to do is, is bring attention to those things. So a lot of times people have no idea what optimal sleep is, what optimal nutrition looks like, what optimal exercise looks like. And you know, what optimal mindset looks like. And it's an unfortunate thing, but I think as coaches and what we like to do is bring that to the table to really see that, you know, if you have someone write down how much sleep they got in a week and they're like, oh my gosh, I got five hours this night, four hours that night. And then I start asking, okay, well, well, why? You know, what are you doing that's impeding sleep? And everyone gives different answers. They're up watching television shows. They're on their phone. They're, they're doing this. Some people, you know, they have kids, so they're, they're up with newborns. That's, I get that. But a lot of times it's this mundane of behaviors of social media or these televisions and phones that are, are taking time away from people and kind of putting their sleep at jeopardy. And I think that's an important part to start to say like, Hey, you could do all the right things on the other end. You can eat well, you can exercise. That's going to only get you so far if your sleep is not there, like Matt said, your hormone in your body not, is not going to cooperate with you and you're not going to be able to effectively be where you want to be. And I think that's important. And same with the exercise, like, you know, guiding them of what they're doing. Is it enough? Is it not enough? Are they doing the right things to push them to their goals? How many times have we heard, oh, I want to lose weight? in a, you know, an equal fitter assessment. And the person says, well, I, I run three times a week. I run two miles and that's about it. And, and it's our job to, to educate and say, okay, Hey, we need to do a little bit more. And here's how we can guide that too. And I think when it comes to people asking these questions of what, where to start, it's going to be, you know, you just kind of start on all aspects of it. And while it might be hard, you might not go a hundred percent all in on one. You might say, hey, for week one, I'm going to get, you know, 
seven hours of sleep. And that might be on the low side for some people, but that if they're sleeping four to five hours, that's a good target increase of sleep. And then say, I'm going to get on a simple exercise program. It's not like you're going to get on this crazy exercise program, this crazy sleep, because once you start changing variables too frequently, so let's say if you want to go from five hours to sleep to eight hours, that's a big overall increase of volume that that person might not understand where that time is going to come from. And they've got to figure out in their life and their schedule, where are they going to take things away? And I think that's a big thing because it's, as we know, of weight loss and anything else, like you need to subtract some things to benefit other things. So if you want more sleep, you have to take something away that's keeping you up at night. And it might be a simple pleasure. Like our body loves it. Our body wants to be the least effective machine on this planet. Like it's not going to give a lot of effort and it's not going to roll out calories. That's why we're getting into these high obesity rates is because the body is innately lazy. Like it's just, there's nothing about it that we can change. And we have to understand that our, our, our brain is built that way from a survival standpoint. Right, it's and not we haven't bad, lived in this environment where, you know, thing. there's no big cat chasing me that I have to go find my food. It's just like, Hey, I can have food in 10 steps and it's simple. I have everything I need. I'm safe. I'm happy. We're good. I don't need to expend energy. And I think it starts to impede on quality of life, whether it's disease and all that other stuff. So that's the stuff I start bringing to the table of awareness, right? And it goes back to kind of like motivation, like making someone aware of who they are, where they are, and kind of what they want is that first initial goal. And a lot of it stems from, from the mind, mindset, cognitive behavior, and like consciousness of, you know, who you are as a human, you know, I like to ask seven questions, you know, what matters the most to someone? What, who relies on you? Who inspires you? What causes you to care about what you do? What are you, what are you grateful for? What gets you out of bed in the morning? And that's a big one. And those like are the questions that you start asking. And then how do you, how do you want to be remembered? You know, if you're not in a room and then what do you value in life? And I think as people start to answer those questions, and they start writing them down. And I sometimes have people write them down and put them on the refrigerator. So each morning that they have to see this, they remind themselves, okay, well, who relies on you today? You know, are you relying on yourself? Are there family members relying on you? Are there kids relying on you? Are there pets relying on you? It doesn't have to be a person. It could be a pet. But to be present for that pet means that you have to have some sort of purpose. And I think that's an important thing in the mindset to start. And then you can get on this path of, hey, I'm going to start working out. I'm going to eat good. I don't like the word clean, but like a good behavior of eating, you know, good amount of protein, fruits and vegetables, really limiting processed sugar. I mean, it, on, on the nutrition side, that's usually step one for me. Like the simplest thing you can do is cut out processed foods. And it's like a win-win for the human body. And they've shown in in studies and in, even on TV shows, like the first thing someone does to want to cut weight, they say, hey, let's cut all processed food out and sugar out and their weight comes down. Yeah. I, uh, you know, I think to sum up the last thing I would want to say, just because, you know, we, we spent a lot of time on these first two questions about motivation and getting started because I think it's so critical and it can really make or break someone's journey. But choices, it comes down to, to choices, you know, Lazy isn't a bad thing. We are intrinsically lazy. That's, that's uh, our DNA, our biology, our, you know, our pathology is that we want to receive or, or like consume more things that can produce energy without expensive energy. energy. Right. So it's like yeah. absolutely in our nature. We just need to realize and think and outthink our biology. Because we got to think, is this going to be a maladaptive behavior? Meaning, is it going to lead to something bad or is it going to lead to something good? So is it good that every day after work, I come home and sit on the couch and eat donuts? Like, if I think about it, if, I'm, if I bring that to my awareness, logically, I'll understand, no, this is not going to be good for me in the long run. So I think that, I think choices, when we can control our choices, it gives the, puts us back in the driver's seat. It allows us to have the, the, the drive to another word drive it allows us to actually have that discipline of grabbing the steering wheel and that strength and that vigor to 
take hold of our lives and manifest the life we want to live. But, you know, before we end this, this call, I do want to kind of do like a, a speed run through the rest of the questions. I think they're great to address, but again, those first two questions are so important for me. So motivation, getting started. If you need assistance, we are absolutely here to help you. That's what we do as personal trainers. We're here to help our community. So don't hesitate to reach out. The, the worst question is the one you don't ask. We have a Facebook training community that we use to help anybody. We, ha you know, we have our program booklets. We have our video training courses. We're trying to just galvanize the community and be there for you in your corner the best we can. So again, don't hesitate to reach out with any questions. Without further ado, let's go on to the next questions. So saw a lot of questions, workouts with, for disabled adults. So without knowing more about specifics, because I just hear disabled and that could be a variety of things. My answer was this depends on your, your disability, but walking, running, cycling, dancing, tennis, swimming, water aerobics, even aqua jogging. Many people with mobility issues find exercising in water especially beneficial as it supports the body and reduces the risk of muscle or joint discomfort. Now, another thing is if you go to wheelchairbodybuilding.com, there is a whole training platform. There's programs. You can see more evidence of people looking more jacked than me and they're in a wheelchair. So it's absolutely doable. Where there's a will, there's a way. But again, it just depends on the severity of your disability and depends on what your disability actually is to what that impedes you from, but absolutely where there's a will, there is a way. Next question, how do I drop chin fat? Now, I've also saw how do I drop arm fat? How do I drop belly fat? How do I drop thigh fat, back fat? The key here is you can't spot reduce fat. You need to get your energy systems properly working. Fat is just stored energy. Muscle also has stored energy. We want to transition away from the idea that our body can just take energy and store it for safekeeping. Instead, we want the body to know that we want it to be ready to use in the muscle and at the forefront because we're active. A body in rest stays at rest and a body in motion stays in motion. Then it takes, so it takes changing one's body composition, which involves diet and exercise with a highlighted portion of challenging resistance training to the entire body and then shoot for losing two to four pounds a week. But that's, we can't, again, we can't spot reduce. We have to get our body to, hey, start pulling from our fat cells to burn energy. Because the idea that we are losing fat is wrong. That's liposuction. What we're doing is we're making our fat cells smaller. The more energy we consume, the more our body is dormant, the more our body stores that fat into the fat cell. When we want to lose weight, we want to make our fat cells smaller. We want to shrink the energy, the stored energy in those fat cells. We're basically saying, you know what? Give me a smaller addict so we get everything out of there. When it comes to removing fat cells, that would be liposuction. Next question. And as I move on to the next question, Eric, feel free to throw in a two cents if you have one. Or you can throw your little hand. Throw a you're hand you're good. No, you got, you're spot on with that one. So I saw this question and it felt different than motivation. It was just said best ways to keep habits. I like to write notes for myself. So I like to have tra like physical training calendars I can see for myself. So like I can check back in and just, just get that repetition of seeing it. You know, we've talked about discovering our why, discovering our purpose, mm -hmm. defining our goals and setting manageable steps to reach our goal. There's a very great image of two people. They're both under ladders. One is at the bottom of his ladder and the, and the rungs are like, really far apart. The other one's at the top of his ladder and the rungs are like stacked right on top of each other. And just the concept of smaller steps lead to bigger outcomes. And yeah. then and it's just re Go ahead. repetitive behavior. Like that's it. Yep. Re repeat that behavior. If it's a positive behavior, repeat it, repeat it, repeat it. After a while, it becomes cyclical, it becomes a habit and it's formed. So then it just becomes like second nature. And I think that's where a lot of people need to realize is like, you have to do the behavior repetitively for so many times to make that a thing. And then you're just going to do it almost automatically. Yeah. 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 Like there's some that, yeah, I'll, I'll dive into that. Next question was, this is kind of funny, but I understand why it's a common question. How do I stay fit, but eat what I want? And it doesn't exist. Was, I mean, you can, but. Well, this was my answer. 
you're going to want to continue adjusting your programs because I think a lot of times people think they're staying fit, but they're just battling entropy. They're not actually seeing progress with their results. They're just making sure they're not getting it like too much, too worse, too quick. So if you continue to adjust your program, so you're always putting various stimuli being uncomfortable, then your body's going to always be making adaptations. If your body's always making adaptations, then the things you're putting in your system have to be used. Like it's, it's like, oh, we're putting energy in our system. I got to repair. I got to recover. We got to get ready for the next day. But if our body's pretty complacent in what it's doing, you're probably going to be starting to be storing those things. It's going to be more stagnant in our system. We could get free radicals floating around our bloodstream. We could cause inflammation. We could cause attachment to different joint locations that could cause more pain later down the line. So and I think this is a good one because I think like, it, you're right. Like it is like you keep adjusting, but you're never going to, get rid of that inflammation right or that free radicals depending on what you're eating and this is i think this is well, why i say no is because you're giving your body something to do because if your program isn't delivering results you're just going through the motions and you want to eat what you want right well it, it's just a matter of time before you start to see in the mirror that that's weighing on mm -hmm. you but you um, can't you can't work out like hard and you just eat whatever you want like you can't eat cake every day and expect to be healthy even though you might stay lean, like the mechanisms of, you know, the ingredients in that, like trans fat, or like omega-6, like seed It'll oils, that stuff's going to cause havoc at a cellular level. So I think where I go with this is you can't really eat whatever you want. Maybe once or twice a month, okay, have at it and then have a great solid program. But you can't do it every day because at a, a metabolism level, it might have caused you a cell level you're constantly putting in things that are going to damage it and your body, like that's the building blocks it's going to have. Yeah, it can burn it off, but it's still creating damage at a DNA level or worse. So it's a hard question to kind of break people's heart with and basically say you can't do that. And, you know, humans aren't designed to have that kind of food in our system. It what didn't exist years and years ago. You know, excess sugar is going to raise insulin which is going to lead to a plethora of problems, even though you are working out, which is kind of interesting that like, if you have raised level of insulin, will drop overall free testosterone in the body, which is going to create a lot of problems, even if you are working out. So it, it's, it's sort of like a, a hard no, but yeah, you still want to be continuing to, you know, monitor and change your program consistently. And, and one thing I want to highlight there is like, like Eric said, it'll eventually catch up to you. You can't just drink beer and eat processed food all day long. Right. And 80, 20 is a general accepted good rule of thumb. Well, let me tell you about 80, 20, 80, 20, 168 hours in a week. That means 80% of that week, you're eating good things at the 134 hours. That gives us 34 hours left. So 20% of the time I'm going to eat shit. Doesn't mean I get 34 hours to eat shit. Because it takes about 36 hours for your body to process something. There's 34 hours that you're allowed to have shit in your body. So you can have, you, you can have like one cheat meal a week, essentially in that 80, 20 rule. So I think a lot of people get, it, it's too ambiguous that 80, 20 idea. They're like, well, I ate a good breakfast. So I'm going to have McDonald's at lunch and then I'll eat a good right. thing. Like, no, because that McDonald's is going to be like a, a roadblock in your gut for digestion for the next 34 hours. So you can't do that every single day because now you now you're like 50 50 if it's just eating clean if it's eating like shit and the other thing i want to just if you don't mind like do you know how what is the length of time for alcohol i believe it's beyond that right they say that that your performance will stunt your protein synthesis will be stunted hormone metabolic will be stunted for up to sometimes it can be like up to 48 hours to, okay that's what I thought. As, yeah. as the as your body's trying to clear the basically, so yeah, you call it alcohol, but it's going to try to basically get the toxins, the poison out of your system, which creates this free radical that damages cells, and so it hangs around in the system a lot longer than people think. Like you're not going to be still drunk or hungover, but it lingers in the system for quite some time. Okay, okay I just wanted to touch on that really quick. Okay, next question was a good 15 minute routine for full body. And that was simply answered with a sprint circuit workout, a clean and jerk workout. Or if you, if you only had 15 minutes for full body routines, three times a week, 
you would deadlift one day, squat one day, and bench press one day. You'd do a five minute warm up, eight minutes of lifting, and two minutes of cool down. Next question yep. How to build chest and abs fast? So, building abs requires weight training to build the muscle and attention to your diet so you can trim that layer of fat that covers them. Aside from a solid diet and exercise routine that includes deadlifts, squats, you can do accessory work like the McGill sit up, the ab wheel. Rollouts, cable tops, cable lifts, pal off presses, planks, and side planks. Building your chest would be more of push ups, pull ups, flat bench, incline bench, incline dumbbell flies, seated cable rows, and overhead presses. Did I miss anything for abs or chest? No, just do high volume of that. If even if you had like a bench press or dumbbells, right? Dumbbells are usually a go to for chest. Just do high volume of that. You'll grow muscle and a lot of obviously high protein. No, one of the questions. Following that up was, what's the difference between incline bench and regular bench? It was funny. I was surprised at how many people asked that question. I, a lot I've of people heard, don't know about this one. Well, I've never even heard anybody asking me that question. So I had to like look it up and reference things, you know, just to make sure I was right. But yeah, incline bench has more upper pec and front delt engagement. It also has a longer range of motion, technically. And then mm -hmm. uh, the incline bench can be easier on people's joints, which I thought was kind of a, a weird one to read about because I've definitely had clients where the incline bench was harder on their joints than the flat bench. So I think that's a little bit more individual based, but what would you say? Anything else you want to touch on there? That it's, it's the incline's easier? No, like that easier, like easier on the shoulder joint. Like it was just talking about possible impingements. And I was like, I guess that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, base. so that one, because as, as a, at the bench floor, a lot of people can tip. If it's at an incline, people can't anterior tilt their scaps. Right. So it, it shortens bench to be here. It shortens the range of motion that the scaps will move in, but not the the pecs. But and it's just more, you know, as you get into different degrees of where you're using, like your your body is going to be able to expand more at different positions, bench press or incline, and it's just that's just the difference, and it's the angle of where your arms are moving through that that arc space. Okay, cool. So last couple here was one question was how to create a fitness plan. So start with your goal, determine the workouts you'll need in your program to get to your goal, determine what your week at a glance looks like. Example is three days of weight training, two days of conditioning, meal prep on Sundays, uh, and then create opportunities for progressions week over week. So write in like three rep maxes or percentage work or look for ways that maybe you're doing a five, three, one, maybe you're doing sets of five, one week, sets of three, another week, and then one, the third week, you can look up Wendler's five, three, one to get an example of what I mean by creating opportunities for progressions, but that's how you write a fitness plan that delivers results. Anything you want to add? Nope. Okay. Last two questions here from this week was exercises for lower back pain and we're going to put a blog article out about this pretty soon because there is definitely a misconception about what you do and how you address lower back pain and don't get me wrong i think we already have one out too it's an older one i tried to look for one i couldn't find it uh i believe it, it's it's out there i think we have to go back and find it but there is one out there on lower back where we also can write another one Okay. Well, the other problem now is like, we have so many blogs that we need to start like trying to catalog, catalog them. So it's easier to navigate in there, but mm -hmm. yes, more money, more problems. No. So you want to strengthen your glutes and your core, because typically that's the problem is you have weak glute, you have a weak core and thus your hip flexors have to take over the job of stabilizing your spine. And when I say weak core, we actually aren't even connected to our ground, to our floor. So we're not stabilized through the floor. And instead of even using our legs to stabilize our spine, our body is literally just using our smaller muscles and our hips to try to stabilize the spine. And then we feel a lot of compression at our lower back because it tugs on our lower back erectors. So yeah, single leg glute bridges, hip thrusts, squats, lunges, step ups, basically strengthening the glute and the core in all these different positions. Start from lying down on your back, Roll to your side, roll to hands and knees position, come up to a tall kneeling position, half kneeling position, and then standing. And you want to be able to strengthen your gluten core, feel them working in all those positions 
so that your lower back doesn't take over and start to work in those positions. So again, you're fixing your movement patterns. The way you pick something up off the ground, you want to use your legs when you're lifting and anchor yourself to the floor and not to your hips where your lower back ends up doing all the work. And I think with, with all those exercises that you, that are all good. And I think a lot of physical therapists will come on and be like, oh, strengthen the lower back. Are you hear it in articles? Like that's the wrong thing. Cause you don't want that back muscle to be any tighter. It's right, the ability of pe people need to learn how to posterior tilt their pelvis and pull that back a little bit. Cause you can do all those exercises Matt just mentioned. And if you do them in a extended or hyperextended state through the lower back, there's no way your glutes are going to activate to push your pelvis up. So you really need to work on tucking your tailbone under and feeling that mechanism happen to decrease or decompress those lower back muscles. And that just comes with being upright humans with gravity. So the, the ability to- our lower back when we lay on the ground, this is our tailbone, this is our, our scaps, scaps, tailbone, and this is usually what our back's doing. We want to get it like that. So our tailbone yep. is almost pointed up to the ceiling. Yeah, that great highlight. So I tell people, we don't, we don't have a tail, right? We need for our tailbone to be on the ground. Like that thing should be off in space. We're not, you know, we're not a cat. We're not a dog. We don't use that for support. So, but people like to, they like to keep that on the ground because that might be one place that they sense on the floor. But think that like for someone to have a brain, take that sense away and get it off the floor and sense your lower back and your upper hips on the floor. Well, partly too, because their lower back is, is engaged. So they think they need to contract the muscle more to stay strong because they feel this achiness as it opens up because the muscle staying engaged while it's trying to lengthen. And in reality, it's just preventing them from getting to where they need to go, which is getting that muscle to relax. But yeah, no, that's a really good point. And a little side note here, a little tidbit here is I actually have a client who, who he, he broke his tailbone and instead of it pointing behind him, when it got repaired, it was pointing like slightly forward. And seriously, like everything we did, it was, it was crazy how everything he did would hurt his back. And it took us forever to like, it took me like a, two weeks to really teach him hip control because of, I think, because of his coccyx. Because it was just positioned so differently that his, ner his central nervous system was, and, and neuromuscular system was just so disconnected. And it was just so funny because, yeah, I just thought it was really interesting. Last question here, and then we'll go. My knees and wrists feel weaker as I age. How do I remedy this? Well, what I think a lot of people are missing out on is resistance training. Not only strengthens muscles, ligaments, tendons, but it even improves bone density. Start with body weight and things that you can complete 10 repetitions of, like an incline push-up or assisted squats and then progress from there. But you're not just going to strengthen a knee or a wrist without also strengthening the muscles around it. Thank you very much. Yep. Resistance training, that's the key. Matt Gluckman, Eric Menchie with Think Fitness Life. If you're ready to make steps towards improving your health or increasing your performance, book a free 30-minute call today by visiting thinkfitnesslife.com.